The year is 1999, a new millennium is approaching and cinema is in a clear period of transition. Films such as The Phantom Menace, The Iron Giant and The Sixth Sense were pushing the industry in bold new directions. All four corners of the earth were holding their breath, awaiting what the next thousand years of film would hold for them. Not least of all was the island of Ireland. The Island of Ireland is a film set which was built in the 1950s by Walt Disney himself to film the true-to-life documentary of the endangered leprechaun species and their overlord Darby O'Gill, known in the Irish language as Il Duce. Everything seemed to be good as Darby O'Gill and the Little People went on to receive critical acclaim, becoming the first and only film on Rotten Tomatoes to receive a 100% rating. But all was not well on the island of Ireland as after fulfilling its role as a film set it had to start functioning as a country, leading to decades of cultural and political instability. This resulted in the mass emigration of some of Ireland's most beloved citizens such as former presidential candidate Mr. Tato. The living potato. I wish I was joking. As the millennium approached, Ireland finally got the chance to prove itself through the medium of the silver screen. The greatest cinematic masterminds in history teamed up to hatch the most accurate portrayal of Ireland ever put to screen. This production would offer Ireland a chance to shed the old stereotypes that were put in place decades prior. Stereotypes of drunks and gingers and tiny mythical men roaming the countryside. If this film went well, then Ireland finally had a chance to enter the 21st century as a modern and respectable nation on the world stage. So that went well. Let's start with the title, The Magical Legend of the Leprechauns. With a title like that, people must have been queuing up and down the streets to get a glimpse of this piece of cinematic history and cinemas, right? Wrong, sir. Wrong. As a matter of fact, The Magical Legend of the Leprechauns was never even released in cinemas, and every single copy was destroyed after the director viewed the first cut of the film. Or at least, that's what they want you to think. What actually happened was that one single copy of the film survived and was kept by a young intern named Dick McDyke, who was, in fact, the long-lost grandson of Hollywood superstar John Wayne. Mr McDyke would go on to found the company Hallmark Entertainment with the sole purpose of distributing the magical legend of the leprechaun secretly on television, without the knowledge of the original production crew. The Magical Legend of the Leprechauns first aired on November 7th, 1999 on the American television channel NBC, and no one ever watched it. Having fulfilled its only purpose, Hallmark soon went into liquidation. Shortly after, Dick McDyke changed his name and went to work for indie video game developer Electronic Arts. This is the copy of Leprechauns that my dad recorded off the TV back in the early 2000s. I remember watching it once, telling my teacher about it, and then never watching it again. But we never got rid of it. Maybe there's some nostalgic connection there, or maybe subconsciously I thought it was a really good movie that'd be worth revisiting in the future. So I thought maybe I'd watch it again and see how I truly feel about this obscure piece of filmmaking. I'm beginning to understand why I never watched it again. The story of the magical legend of the leprechauns is one as old as time itself. It's one which centres around the growing Americanization of European society and culture and the brutal destruction of the natural landscapes of the world through the unstoppable and ever-encroaching forces of urbanization and industrialization. However, this time, there's leprechauns. In a scene ripped straight from The Quiet Man, we are introduced to the film's protagonist, Jack an American businessman who is involved in the construction of a big, unnamed property development somewhere in the Irish countryside. But Jack is ashamed of this, or something, and keeps it a secret from everyone he meets so that the screenplay can have its conflict during the third act. Jack is a simple man who enjoys the smaller things in life, such as golfing and horse racing and generally just being a bit of a stalking creep to every woman he meets in Ireland. Come here. I'm sorry, alright? 
After being caught red-handed snooping on a naked woman, a humiliated Jack returns home and attempts to drink himself to death. Unfortunately for Jack, he only manages to drink himself into a state of hallucination before manifesting the Muldoons. A family of leprechauns who are in the middle of a cold war with the fairies of the forest, who are the ones that control the weather patterns of the world. Obviously. Also, side note, the fairies just sort of live in this big castle that's never explained. I mean, the movie's set in Kerry, so like it's, it's a rural area, but there's a town nearby. We see people in the movie, and this big castle's never explained. It's not even mentioned that the thing is invisible to humans. Like, it's never even brought up by anyone. No one sees it, ever. It's so, it's so weird. It's so weird. <clears throat> anyway. Our friend Jack has got more pressing matters on his mind than the centuries-old leprechaun fairy war and goes to make amends with Kathleen, the woman he was stalking in the forest the day beforehand. Jack attempts to do this by breaking onto her property, continuing to stalk her, and then when she gets mad, because obviously she gets mad, Jack makes the local priest gaslight Kathleen into apologising to him for harassing him. Now, are you a peeping Tom, as she says? No, nope. fair enough. Kathleen tries to escape from Jack's stalking by renting a horse and simply riding away. However, Kathleen is a woman and therefore is not allowed to rent or ride a horse at all. Looks like someone forgot to read the constitution. Now, at this stage you might be thinking, Hold up. This legend doesn't seem very magical or leprechaun-y. But we are getting to that. Trust me. Jack decides to try and impress Kathleen by getting on a horse of his own and leaving her in the dust, showing her just how much fun it is to do the things that she is not allowed to do. As he's riding, the Muldoons appear once again to remind Jack that maybe this isn't the right way to flirt. But Jack doesn't take advice from leprechauns and tries to commit leprechaun homicide, forgetting of course that leprechauns are immortal and can't die. Or can they? But in the end, Jack's flirting method pays off, and Kathleen is finally smitten, somehow. Meanwhile, Mickey Muldoon, the youngest of the Muldoons, gathers the boys to infiltrate a very exclusive fairy ball in the very well-hidden fairy castle, which you can only get to by frog bubbles. Obviously. While there, Mickey falls in love with the fairy princess in less than 60 seconds because this film was actually set in Arendelle the whole time. The leprechauns are soon discovered and Mickey flies away with the boys because, apparently, leprechauns can only fly when they're in love. Obviously. Alas, one of the fairies finds out that Mickey's been courting the fairy princess and kills one of his friends. So, it looks like we finally discovered the one thing that can kill a leprechaun. The dramatic low point of the second act break. I wish I knew this guy's name, but I don't think the screenwriters gave him one. I can relate to his dying wish though. I could do with a drink or something. And well, you've got to hand it to the filmmakers though. They managed to include the trifecta of Irish stereotypes in just half an hour. Now, if that's not dedication to accurate representation of Ireland, then I don't know what is. Whew, is it getting hot in here? Or is that just a feeling of a cold war becoming a hot one? That's right, the leprechauns are mad that a fairy killed one of their own and prepare a full assault on the fairy kingdom. Meanwhile, Jack decides that he should go back to America because he realised that he misses civilization and urges Kathleen to come with him. When she very understandably refuses, Jack gets huffy, like strops all over the place. He's be like, I rode a horse for you, why don't you love me? And Kathleen's like, I've met you three times and you're a huge creep and you made the priest get mad at me. So Jack ends up storming out as global warming is happening right before him because the fairies who control the weather decide to pull a B-movie and go on strike while they prepare for war. So the fairies and leprechauns prepare for battle. The fairy princess goes into protective custody and Jack gets on a train to leave island for good. Typical climactic stuff. Everything is finally coming to a head. And then... Talk about an anti-climax, that train whistle has been seared into my memory as the very first time my tiny child brain was disappointed in the ending of a movie. 
I remember my dad explaining to me that this was a decide your own ending type of movie. But if you dig a little deeper, you can find that there's actually a lot more going on under the surface of the magical legend of the leprechauns than meets the eye. Let's imagine that I was five years old when I first viewed this cinematic masterpiece. That would mean that for 16 years I've ran with this make up your own ending theory. Believe it or not, but I actually did a bit of research before writing this video, and what I found shook me to my very core. No, this isn't a movie, sir. Really? This is so much more than a movie. As it so happens, after founding Hallmark Entertainment, our old friend Dick McDyke never actually intended to release The Magical Legend of the Leprechauns in its entirety. Allow me to explain. McDyke truly believed that this would be the film to save Ireland's reputation on the global stage, and thus ended up misinterpreting the hype that would be surrounding the movie. Predicting more hype than there actually was, McDyke split the film into two halves, opting to air only one half on television for free. Immediately after the first half ended, an advertisement would air informing viewers that they could purchase the second half of the film by visiting the film's website or by calling McDyke directly. This shady business practice, originally known as extra purchasable content, was set to herald in a new era of home video entertainment. Watch half the movie in the cinema, and then purchase the other half on your way out. It would have completely transformed and revolutionised the way we watch films for good. The magical legend of the leprechauns was merely the trial run for this new practice. Unfortunately for McDyke, no one ever saw the magical legend of the leprechauns, and this new industry practice was dead on arrival. McDyke's dream of a cinematic economic revolution was over. Today, The Magical Legend of the Leprechauns is listed on IMDb as a television mini-series with two episodes, possibly as a cover-up to pretend this failed industry practice never happened. As far as I'm aware, no living person has ever seen the so-called second episode of Leprechauns, forever casting it into the foreboding abyss of lost media content. The only evidence of its existence which still remains is the short TV advert which followed the original broadcast, as well as a handful of screenshots from which we can only theorise what the plot would have been. It looks like they were going to start leaning really heavily into the Romeo and Juliet aspect of the story. Uh, I think maybe Mickey and the Princess were going to start dabbling into a cheeky bit of fascism. I, I, I don't really know what to say about these guys. I think they're aliens. I, I don't know. I, they really jumped the shark on this one here. In the end, The Magical Legend of the Leprechauns failed in its original goal of introducing the world to a new, modern island of Ireland, and its impact can still be felt through the movie set in Ireland to this day. We're miserable. You kissed him! It was he that kissed me! That's what's got him locked up! I don't understand you people. Its release heralded a brand new wave of movies that were based in Ireland, making full use of the stereotypes which Leprechauns had originally sought to destroy. But. At the same time, not one living soul has actually watched the film. So perhaps the true legacy of the magical legend of the leprechauns is one which will stand the test of time as a reminder of how some movies or ideas just should never make it past the conception phase. Which, in this Gene's opinion, is no legacy at all. <laughs>